This is a production of WTVI PBS Charlotte. Tonight, a special one hour Carolina Impact shares information that could help save your life by exploring obesity, high blood pressure, and diabetes. With one in three adults being obese, how do you know when to explore bariatric surgery? This is not cosmetic surgery. This surgery is uh, for medical necessity. High blood pressure or hypertension is known as the silent killer. There was no pain, no great pain. It can damage the heart, it can damage the kidneys, it can damage the brain. If left untreated, diabetes can cause blindness, kidney failure, and amputations. They said her blood sugar was 740, and I said, okay. And he said, Mrs. Self, normal blood sugar is 100. You need to get to the emergency room. Tonight, we share information to empower you to take control of your health. Funding for tonight's special is provided by Novant Health. Thanks so much for joining us for our Community Health Forum. I'm Amy Burkett. We're excited that you're with us today. Three health conditions that affect so many of us are obesity, hypertension, and diabetes. We've got a live studio audience with us today, joining us from Pease Auditorium on the campus of Central Piedmont Community College. And I'd also like to welcome you, our viewer at home. We appreciate you and appreciate the fact that you want to empower yourself to learn how to take control of your health so that you can live an extraordinary life. And we've got great information to help you do that today. So you know what? We've got an incredible panel of experts joining us, so we would like to meet them right now. We begin with Dr. Marcus Plesha. He's the health director for Mecklenburg County Health Department. He's tasked with protecting the public health of about a million people in Mecklenburg County. He leads the largest health department in the Tar Heel State. Next up, we have Senior Vice President of Business and Community Partnerships for Novant Health, Dr. Ophelia Garman-Brown. She joins us and she's a board certified family practitioner and has touched the lives of thousands of patients in Charlotte and around the world as a medical missionary. Next up, we have Dr. David Vollinger. He's the lead physician at Novant Health Bariatric Solutions in Charlotte, Huntersville and Matthews. He's also the medical director of Novant Health Bariatric Center and chief of the Department of General Surgery at Novant Health Presbyterian Medical Center. Next up, let's meet Dr. Jerome Williams, an 18 year Charlotte cardiologist He's currently Division Chief and Chairman of Adult Cardiology at Novant Health, Heart and Vascular Institute at Presbyterian Medical Center. Dr. Williams, we appreciate your time. <laughs> Finally, let's meet Mr. Bowtie. It's Dr. Adam Spitz. He serves as the Medical Director of the Novant Health Diabetes Center and he's an attending physician at Presbyterian Endocrinology and Osteoporosis Consultants. Dr. Spitz, thanks so much for your time. So let's kick it off with a question, first of all, and I'm always the guinea pig. Before we started recording today, we had a health screening from our friends at Novon Health, where folks were able to check their BMI, they were able to get their blood pressure tested, and they were able to do that A1C test, which tells you if you have prediabetes. So I'm grateful that I did well on two out of three. My blood pressure's good, my A1C is good, I don't have prediabetes, but I got a little bit of an issue with my BMI and I need to lose weight. And as that middle-aged woman, I bet maybe there's a few of you in the audience tonight who can also relate with that. So I wanna ask our panelists right out of the gate, what advice can you give us, if each of you could give us just two tips of something very practical, maybe very small, that we can actually start doing today that will make a big difference in our health. So let's get started. We begin, Dr. Plesha, what can we do? Well, so my tip is a little bit broader. Uh, I represent the public health department, and what we try to do is help people make those responsible choices, make the healthy choice the easy choice. So a couple of examples of the kind of things I think we can do in our community. We can make sure if we want people to eat healthy, there's healthy food available for them. Uh, best thing is if you have a good full service grocery store in your neighborhood, but if not, we try to work with corner stores, little mom and pop shops to make sure they are able to stock healthy items as well. If we want people to exercise, make it easy for them to exercise. We work a great deal with Parks and Rec to, to develop parks in every neighborhood, and we try to make sure those parks are attractive and safe so that people are able to be physically active. Those are some of the things we try to do to help make the healthy choice the easy choice. And that's what we want. We want it to be easy because it's the easy will actually do it. Dr. Garmin Brown, what tips do you have for us? I'd just say two simple things. Love yourself and know that you matter enough to take care of yourself, first of all. And then secondly, I understand that it takes 21 days to change a habit. So instead of sodas or sweet tea, drink water with every meal, 21 days. 
and see what effect you have on your life. And then we might not want that sweet tea or that soda after 21 days. That's the hope. But Dr. Garmin Brown, as a woman, I'm gonna hit you with this one. We take care of everyone else in our lives and sometimes I know I'm guilty of not taking care of myself. What advice might you have for women as well? You know, I think about what that we learn all the time on the airplane. It says put on your own oxygen first. I think as women we have to know that we matter. And if we don't know that we matter, uh, it's th the problem is, is that when we don't focus on ourselves, then everyone in our family is really not being focused on in a way that we need to. So women really have to understand that we matter and you have to take the time to care for yourself. Great advice. Dr. Bollinger, what helpful tips do you have for us? Piggybacking on what North Carolina does, the Eat Smart, Move More program. In, in, in terms of eating smart, uh, it, it's fruits and vegetables. It's, as he's saying, the corner drugstore. It's a rainbow plate, right? We want all the colors of the rainbow on our plate. If we do that, we're getting the vitamins, minerals, proteins, and nutrients that we need. And then moving more, things as simple as take the stairs and not the elevator. Park a little farther, walk to the store. Just activity, be active. It, it's not all about exercise and the gym. That's important, but just be more active and you'll see a huge difference. Dr. Williams, what sage advice do you have for us? You're listening to the panelists. One thing that rings throughout all the statements is that in order to be healthier, live healthier, and take care of yourself, it's a very intentional process. It's a very intentional process. We must put on the calendar 30 minutes of exercise every day. It's not good enough to say, I'm going to exercise. You mentioned uh, uh, to Dr. Garman Brown, uh, what do women need to do? Obviously, women need to focus on, on their health and, and on themselves, but everyone needs to have a focus and uh, schedule these activities throughout their day. So we schedule everything else in our lives. You're saying schedule exercise as well. Absolutely. We run places with our children. We run places with our spouses and our uh, places of employment. Take care of ourselves first. Dr. Spitz, we're going to give you the last word in this column. What advice do you have for us? In order to implement the healthy eating, especially now springtime, uh, go to the farmer's market. Uh, not only is there a, a great selection of uh, healthy fruits and vegetables, it's more affordable and uh, you get the double benefit in that you're, you're helping the local economy and helping local growers and I think that's great. Accountability is important. There are a lot of devices out there, uh, apps for your phone, things that you can wear on your wrist that monitor your movement and so getting that 30 minutes of activity, you don't need a block of time, it's, it can be cumulative. And if you have a sedentary job, a great way is to wear one of those things to provide that daily feedback that you need. You know, and that has helped me since the first of the year. I got a step counter and did kind of a control group. How many steps did I take on an average day before I was being intentional about it? And it might have been 3,000 to 4,000. So that was at the beginning of the year. And once I started counting those steps, I know 10,000 is the goal every day. But now even on a bad day, I'm hitting at least 7,000 steps. So that's quite an improvement from where I was. I've still got a long way to go, but I think sometimes even baby steps is a good way to start, panelists. Mm -hmm. We've got a series of questions for you at home and our audience. And let's see how much you know about your health and what's important. And this is a true or false question. Two thirds of Americans are overweight or obese. What do we think? No one's shouting in the audience. Oh, I can hear you at home. <laughs> You're all so smart, but I started out with the easiest one. Yes, the answer is true. One third are overweight and one third of Americans are actually obese. Dr. Plesha, looking at Mecklenburg County numbers, what are the greatest concerns regarding obesity for children and adults that you have? Well, these are, these are the diseases of our time. I mean, the, the problem with this, this epidemic of obesity that we're seeing not now just with adults, but with children as well, is that we know that that's, those are the precursors, those are the things that cause people to go on and develop conditions like diabetes, high blood pressure, and then as a result of that, heart disease, even cancer. People forget that cancer is, is risk, obesity is a risk factor for cancer. So we're very concerned about this, the, these increasing rates we've seen across the community over time. Over the last 20 years, it's just gone up, up, and up. And we've got, we've got to do something to stop that. I think probably our best bet is what we do in the schools. We have children in schools every day and we can do programs and have policies that help them have more nutritious offerings to eat and also be active. Get out and play uh, for at least a half an hour a day. 
When we were kids, it was easier to get out and play because we didn't have all the electronic devices. I think it's harder nowadays that there's so many great electronics. Well, but you know what? We've got one more true or false question for you. And my question right now is, you'd have to lose a lot of weight to make a difference on your health. Is that true or false? I knew you knew all these answers. They're gonna get progressively harder as we go on. The answer is false. Dr. Garmin Brown, losing just 10 pounds, you told me, can make a significant difference on your health. Tell us a little bit more about what type of improvements we can see with just a small weight loss. With just a 10 pound weight loss, you can see a, a, a decrease in your blood pressure. With just a small amount of weight loss, you can see your hemoglobin A1C go from a pre-diabetic range to a normal range. And with just a little bit of weight loss, you'll feel better about yourself. So in feeling better about yourself, you'll move more and do more. That's what we need to do, move more and do more. That's our mantra for the night. Well, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, most Americans are about 23 pounds overweight. Now, diet and exercise should always be our first lines of defense, but sometimes diet and exercise just isn't enough. Carolina Impact's Jeff Rivenbark explains how bariatric surgery can help in some cases. It's a chore many dread, but for Tom Bauer, a trip to the grocery store offers an opportunity to learn more about the foods he should and shouldn't eat. He's already learned a lot. A few years ago, he was a much heavier man. 428 pounds. And carrying around that much weight made simple task more difficult. I couldn't cross my legs. I had difficulty in tying my shoes. It'd bend over to and I would gasp for breath when I came back up. I didn't believe I was big as I was. In the movie The Matrix, actor Keanu Reeves dodges bullets. And Bauer says that's the way he felt because he was dodging one health scare after another due to his weight. That's when he started looking into bariatric surgery. This is not cosmetic surgery. This surgery is uh, from medical necessity. Dr. Carl Lowe says only those who are severe or morbid obese should have the procedure. People who have the weight that, that we're talking about are usually 100 pounds overweight. According to the National Institutes of Health, bariatric patients should have a BMI or body mass index of 40 or more. Bauer's BMI was more than 50. There are exceptions for people who fall between 35 and 40. They may also qualify for surgery, but they have to have some other medical problem like high blood pressure, diabetes, sleep apnea, heart disease. The benefits of bariatric surgery include more energy, greater self-esteem and self-confidence, enhanced mobility, and lowering one's chances of developing weight-related diseases including type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure, which can lead to death. There are risks such as leaks, bleeding, vitamin, mineral, or protein deficiency, blood clots, and in rare cases, death. Patients who qualify for the surgery must first meet with a nutritionist to learn how to eat properly, count calories, read food labels, and keep a food log. They have to see a psychiatrist also to make sure that they are mentally ready for the, the lifestyle change that they're going to have after bariatric surgery. You also have to discuss with a physician the best weight loss surgery for you. Bauer's physician recommended sleeve gastrectomy, more commonly called gastric sleeve. The procedure involves creating about five incisions on the abdomen. A device called a trocar is inserted into the incisions. Surgical instruments are then placed into the trocars to access the abdominal cavity. During sleeve gastrectomy, 85% of the stomach is removed, leaving a thin vertical sleeve shaped like a banana. This reduces the stomach to about one-tenth of its original size. You lose weight due to less food intake. When he started on this journey, Bauer weighed 428 pounds. In less than a year, he's lost 160. Surgery is just the first step to reaching a healthier weight. Regardless of the weather, you'll find Susie Ivey walking around Charlotte's Freedom Park at least three times a week. When I'm out walking, I just tell myself, this is the new me, and I just need to just keep pushing forward. Before having bariatric surgery, she remembers spending lots of time at home alone. When I was heavy, I always sit and be depressed and frustrated because I couldn't get the weight off. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't go anywhere. At 280 pounds, her weight led to a variety of health issues. 
I ended up having a mini stroke. I ended up having a heart attack. And when I went back to my family physician, he said, no more of those fake diets. I want you to go home and think about the gastro bypass surgery. That was five years ago. And today, Ivy's doctor couldn't be more proud of her. I said, what is your secret? Tell me how you're able to achieve this long-term success uh, so I can bottle it up and give it to everyone. She said, well, Dr. Lowe, you operated on me here, but until I got it in my heart and in my mind, nothing was going to matter. Ivy turned 62 this year, and she's amazed by how great she feels. I'm healthy. I don't have sleep apnea anymore. I don't have shortness of breath anymore. I sleep better at night. I'm just a different person. In addition to becoming more physically active, bariatric patients also have to commit to changing their eating habits for life. Thank you. What I look at is the amount of protein. If it doesn't have protein in it, more than likely I won't eat it. Then I look at the carbohydrates and I look at the sugars. And so consequently, I'm looking at the label a lot more than I had in the past. And so my focus is much more on the vegetable aisle, lean proteins, and in the yogurts. If you're severely obese, Bauer recommends talking with your doctor about bariatric surgery. It is something that can change your life forever, but you have to be ready. This is not the easy fix. This takes a lot of commitment, it takes a lot of courage, it takes a lot of stamina, but it also works. You gotta have that mindset that that's what you need to do. You, that's what I need to do, and you need to stay focused on it. Just don't give up, because you can do it. I did it, you can do it. Both Ivy and Bauer realize long-term success now depends on the decisions they make daily regarding their eating habits and physical activity. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jeff Rivenbark reporting. Thanks so much, Jeff. Now we're going to turn to our panelists for a little more conversation. Let's begin with Dr. Vollinger. You have devoted a tremendous amount of your time to bariatric surgery, and there are a variety of surgeries that can be done. Help us understand a little bit about some of the varieties. Sure. First, an update. Tom has now lost 200 pounds and just is a, is a, is a billboard for what we did. That's really huge. Excited. Uh, we were fortunate that we can provide a tool to help people lose weight, and, and, and I say it that way intentionally. Uh, it's really all about eating better, moving more, changing behavior, but a lot of folks where they get very severe uh, a disease, severe obesity, they need more help, they need a tool, and so we provide that, and, and whether it's in Tom's case, taking the stomach from a bag into a tube, otherwise known as a sleeve gastrectomy, in Miss Ivy's case, we literally bypass part of the stomach and make a small pouch, or even something as, as simple as putting a band around the top part of the stomach. Those are all things we can offer as tools to help people who really need it, who, whose weight is affecting their health in a very detrimental way. Well, you know what? Another part of obesity, we see that one tool, as you mentioned, is bariatric surgery, but BMI is a big tool that knowing our numbers can help us reduce health problems in the future. Talk to us a little bit about the BMI. Well, the BMI, B body mass index, is a uh, measurement of, of your weight as it relates to, to your height. And um, an elevated BMI not only contributes to obesity, but can contribute to hypertension, diabetes, and a whole host of other uh, medical problems. And um, as Dr. Vollinger mentioned, uh, the um, gastric bypass surgery is, is one tool, uh, part of a whole comprehensive program of dietary changes, exercise, weight loss, and as I mentioned earlier, a very intentional um, strategy for this. Um, I can't think of anything more important than one's health, and if we don't devote the time, energy, and effort for one's health, I'm not sure what we should be focusing on. Doctors, I want to make this sort of a potpourri. What other advice do you have, and you can just chime in at any time, to help people deal with that BMI? And sometimes, I admit, even today, I was afraid to step on that scale. You don't often want to know, but I think putting your head in the sand is even worse. Also consider the BMI as a number, right? It's just your height and your weight. There are other things, you know, there's circumference. Your, your waist size is a very important thing to look at. For example, uh, Cam Newton's BMI is gonna be high, but he's bone and muscle, right? So, so, so it's not the only thing. So, but BMI is important as, as a marker. And if, it, if it's over 25, you're starting to get in the overweight category. If it's over 30, you're in the obese category. So the things you do is you start with the basics. You start with eating right. 
You start moving more. You start changing the behaviors. Things like stress, anxiety, depression just need to be controlled. And one thing we often forget is sleep. An average of seven hours of sleep has been shown to really help you have more energy and less sugar cravings throughout the day. Anyone else have something to add when it comes to watching and preventing obesity? Well, you know, I wouldn't let the BMI be something that you're afraid of. It's, it's just another thing to give you an awareness that things need to change. And as uh, it has been said, when you look at a person's uh, body makeup, uh, a person who is heavier around the middle has a greater incidence of having cardiovascular disease. A person who is heavier around the hip area is less likely. We call it the apple and the pear. And um, so just the BMI by itself wouldn't really indicate what, which person is at greater risk, which person is at greater risk for sleep apnea. So the BMI doesn't do all of that, but it really serves us well to let us know, you know, there's some things you need to pay attention to and so it helps us in that regard. I think is very helpful for people sometimes is social support. I mean some of the most effective uh, weight loss interventions are these weight groups, people who come together to support each other in exercising more, eating better so they can lose weight. So that's something for people to think about as well is, is looking for other people who can help you, other people who are struggling with the same issue. You know what, I think right now we're gonna take a question from the audience. Hi, my name is Harriet Dudley, and you mentioned earlier about helping children in schools. What messages, strategies, or practices would you give for uh, people preparing early childhood, zero to five, either children who have, who are overweight, or who are going in the pathway of becoming overweight? Well, I'll just, I'll just say one thing about that to start off, and I'm just going to focus on one specific message we have, and that is breastfeeding. I mean, one of the most important things that we can do early in life is to breastfeed children. That, that those children tend to have a much more ideal weight, and they tend to go forward and have less problems with obesity, and that's something you do uh, right, at, right at zero to one. I think we have to introduce healthy uh, lifestyles at an early age. Um, Dr. Garman Brown mentioned it takes 21 days to, to, to form a habit, whether it be a good habit or a bad habit, and I think if we start early on with uh, good um, um, eating habits, introduction of fruits and vegetables at an early age, introduction of exercise, uh, the whole concept of wellness, uh, I think if we start at an early age, it gains traction early on and, and hopefully uh, later on in life uh, uh, kids will continue to um, uh, subscribe to those behaviors. And along the same lines, uh, it's, uh, it is mom and dad. And, uh, you know, with a, a, a child with one obese parent is 70% more likely to be obese, with two parents, 90%. So it's, so it's mom and dad, the lifestyle, the environment they grow up in, and, and what mom and dad are doing make all the difference in the world in a, in a child. So as a final word before we move on to our next topic, what do we want to let people know about obesity and, and how we can prevent it so that we can prevent some of those horrible health complications? Uh, summarizing the big four, the big four pillars are uh, healthy nutrition, uh, getting the right amount of sleep, getting more exercise and activity. Don't look at exercise as a bad word and be more active. Uh, really modify and change your behavior, develop these healthy habits, as Dr. Garman Brown has suggested, and, and control your stress. If we just do those five things, uh, we're going to make a big difference in our weight and our health. And I just want to add that if one looks at the risk factors for most diseases, obesity is going to be listed. For, for almost any disease, obesity is going to be listed. So obesity is almost like this umbrella that, that it overshadows us in terms of uh, us not having the best health we could have. Keep in mind that the BMI is a number and um, there is something to be said for fitness independent of, of BMI, a uh, phrase that sometimes used is fat but fit. And so somebody who is skinny, who is sedentary, who eats badly, um, is not necessarily healthy. Someone whose BMI is elevated, maybe that's what everybody in their family looks like. Uh, certainly in some women who have the pear shape, so they have just more body fat here that may not necessarily be as high a health risk. If they're eating healthy and they're active, they're a healthy person. And so we, we need to also be careful and not just start labeling everybody across the board. Uh, BMI is a great population tool, um, but for the individual we have to remember that those behaviors are independently associated with good or bad health depending on how the person is living. Uh, also, if someone's BMI is elevated and they lose some weight and they're keeping that weight off, or if they were gaining weight before and 
they've just stopped gaining weight, even if their BMI is high, it's important that we treat them as a success and not treat them as a failure just because their BMI isn't technically underneath a certain cutoff level. Because that can add to your stress. And I heard that you say stress can add to problems. So, but one of the things that can help us combat stress is exercise, right? Absolutely. So it all does feed together and it seems like, you know, once we practice what we preach, once we do what our minds know to do, we're all in a little bit better shape. Well, let's move on and talk about high blood pressure for a few minutes. You know, many high blood pressure issues lead to heart problems. This is something we want to try and prevent. And according to the American Heart Association, more than 20% of all people with high blood pressure don't even know they have it. So it's quiz time again. Get your thinking caps on. I bet you'll do as well as you did last time. How many deaths per day are attributed to high blood pressure? Is it A, 100 deaths per day, B, 1,000 deaths per day, or C, 1 million deaths per day? What do you think? There's a variety in the audience here. Today I've heard A, I've heard C. Well, the answer is almost 1,000 deaths per day. So the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention states that more than 360,000 Americans died in 2013 and high blood pressure was a contributing cause. So our next question, what is the annual estimated cost associated with high blood pressure? It gets tougher, I told you it would. Is it A, $25 billion? B, $51 billion, or C, $100 million. So how much does it cost us a year? I heard some C's for $100 million, but the answer is B, $51 billion. Dr. Garmin Brown, that's a whole lot of money. $51 billion? That's a whole lot of money. But when you think of what the effects of hypertension are, heart disease, you know, and limb disease. Really, hypertension, I think of the blood vessels, and, and I feel strange talking about this with Jerome sitting here, but I feel like the blood vessels are like the railroad track. And hypertension disrupts the railroad track, so it disrupts organs all through our bodies, and subsequently, you get this $51 billion number, which is huge. And it is a number wherein, if we were to really focus on the causes of hypertension, it's preventable. Many of them are preventable. So we could really take that number down and do a whole lot for our children and our health department and things that we would need to do. Well, you know what? One in three American adults has pre-hypertension. Now that's meaning their numbers are higher than normal, but not yet high enough to be considered high blood pressure. So high blood pressure usually has no warning signs or symptoms. This is why we call it the silent killer. Carolina Impact's Daniel Koser introduces us to a man who initially ignored the warning signs and is extremely lucky that he got a second chance. I'm lying in the ambulance on the way up here thinking, what have I done? There was no pain, no great pain, you know, it was not the Hollywood thing where you got your hands around your throat. It, 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 it sneaks up on you, it's insidious. But less than a year after his heart attack, 57-year-old Doug Presley enjoys his cardio rehab class with a little classic rock. Don't you cry no more. Well, I'm happy because I'm still here. <laughs> Doug says a number of factors led up to his heart attack, including prehypertension. His doctor warned him years ago the condition put him at risk for developing hypertension or high blood pressure. 110 over 70. Very good. I kept telling myself, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do better tomorrow. You know, I'll exercise tomorrow. I won't eat junk food tomorrow. According to the CDC, or Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, blood pressure refers to the force of blood pushing against the walls of the arteries as the heart pumps. Think of your heart muscle as one of these resistance bands. When your blood pressure is high, your heart is being overstretched again and again. Eventually, your heart will wear out, making it harder to pump blood to the rest of your body. High blood pressure damages arteries. It can damage um, the heart, it can damage the kidneys, uh, it can damage the brain. Health experts measure blood pressure using two numbers. The first number, called systolic blood pressure, measures the pressure in your blood vessels when your heart beats. The second number, diastolic blood pressure, measures the pressure in your blood vessels when your heart rests between beats. 
a measurement reading less than 120 systolic and 80 diastolic for adults, or 120 over 80 means you're in the normal range. If your blood pressure falls between 120 and 139 over 80 to 89, you have prehypertension. Experts say consider this a warning, you're at risk for developing hypertension, classified as a reading higher than 140 over 90. Doctors recommend checking your blood pressure often. So a good trend is to actually have a blood pressure monitor at home and to check it. It may be once a week, maybe once a month. Dr. Tom Berenger calls high blood pressure the silent killer because it doesn't usually have any warning signs or symptoms. High blood pressure also increases your risk for cardiovascular disease, including heart attack and stroke. Statistics show one third of adults have hypertension and your risk for developing the condition increases with age. So past 50, it's approaching more like one out of two. And past 70, 75, you're actually seeing more people with elevated blood pressure than with normal blood pressure. The CDC says African Americans develop high blood pressure more often and at an earlier age than Caucasians and Mexican Americans. And this may surprise you. Women are about as likely as men to develop hypertension. Several factors, including family history, health conditions, and an unhealthy lifestyle can also lead to high blood pressure. I probably go in through five Coca-Colas a day. Following his heart attack, Doug enrolled in this 12-week cardio rehab program. I can go ahead and put in the target heart rate range that we have now. Here he worked with a registered nurse, exercise physiologist, and dietitian to lower his blood pressure from 140 over 93 to 112 over 73. He also lost 35 pounds. Doctors suggest patients recovering from heart disease attend classes three times a week, starting each session by strapping on a heart monitor, checking their blood pressure, and recording their resting heart rate. Then they get to work, strengthening their heart through aerobic exercise. And he would come in and, and put his head down and really work hard and continue to push himself a little harder. And they make it fun. It's not a chore to come in here. Doug says a second chance at life motivated him to make changes. Looks good. Your heart rate's 114. I've had my warning. I don't think you get very many warnings. It's just heartwarming to watch him on this journey and know that you know, we probably extended his life. It's just what you dream of as a nurse. Just as these resistance bands stretch to help strengthen muscles, this class helped Doug stretch out of his comfort zone to help strengthen his heart. Now a proud graduate of cardio rehab, Doug takes each day in stride, continuing on a path towards better health. For Carolina Impact, I'm Danielle Koser reporting. Thanks so much, Danielle. Now to talk about taking ownership of your life, we're gonna turn it over to Dr. Jerome Williams for a moment. Dr. Williams, we saw in that story the difference it made once he got the warning sign the first time, but not everybody gets a warning and a, and a do-over or a reset opportunity. How do we get it right the first time so that we don't have to worry about that? Well, as Dr. Uh, Barringer mentioned in the uh, profile, uh, high blood pressure is considered the silent killer, uh, often because the first uh, symptoms um, are often uh, too late. Uh, the damage is being done in a quiet fashion. I tell folks in, in my clinic when I see patients, there are a number of factors that contribute to hypertension factors that uh, we may not always control. We can't control our gender, we can't control our age, uh, we can't control our family history. However, we can control our behavior. We can control uh, cigarettes. If we smoke, we should eliminate cigarettes. If we have uh, increased uh, intake of salt or salty foods, we need to reduce that. If we have reduced intake of vegetables and uh, fruit, we need to in increase those types of foods, which will help uh, with high blood pressure. I always uh, like to use a um, um, a little saying, uh, measure, monitor, and maintain. In order to uh, deal with high blood pressure, we have to know we have high blood pressure, so we have to measure our blood pressure. Uh, once we measure it, and if we are hypertensive, we have to uh, monitor it on a regular basis, whether it be weekly, uh, uh, monthly, or annually, depending on how high your blood pressure is. And then we have to maintain the lifestyle and changes in order to keep our blood pressure under control. This will help, hopefully, reduce the number of complications from high blood pressure. But it's all about knowing that number. You can't Absolutely. fix what you don't know is broken. Well, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports that 67 million adults have high blood pressure, but less than half, 
only 47% actually know they have the condition and what they can do about it. So there are lots of reasons that people just don't understand their numbers. And we want to talk to our doctors a little bit more. Dr. Plesha, help us, what are you seeing from the county standpoint of people is it because perhaps we live in the South and maybe our diets are even worse because we like some fried chicken more than perhaps our Northern friends that perhaps there's a bigger problem here? Well, what we see is that cardiovascular disease rates are, like, like many of the rates of chronic diseases, are much, much higher in the Southeast. Uh, and it's hard to tease out exactly what the cause of that is. Some of that may be diet, uh, fried foods, sweet tea. Um, you know, one of the things that people often don't think about uh, and it's alluded to already is how much salt is in your food. Uh, and this is something that I think individuals can pay attention to, but we have also tried in the health department to start working with restaurants and uh, makers of processed food to see if we can lower that salt content to begin with, because oftentimes people are eating packaged foods that they have no control over salt and how much salt may be in them. Uh, but you know, I think all of these things are very important. Uh, when you look at this issue that, like you said, our rates, our health is much worse here if we live in the southeast than if we live in other parts of the country. So now we want to go to our audience and hear a question from one of our audience members who is here today. Please go ahead with your question, ma'am. My name is Denise Cathy, and I am a part of Village Heartbeat. I'm happy to stand here and talk about Village Heartbeat. It's an excellent program. Our church has been involved, Greater Salem, for three years. The program makes you accountable of what you eat, the way you exercise, changing your lifestyle. But my question to Dr. Plesher, the program is so good, what can we do to make sure other churches are involved? We need to triple that. We need to have over 100 churches involved because it's an excellent program. Dr. Plesha, how do you spread a good thing like wildfire, I guess? Well, this is what I was talking about a little bit earlier. That um, these programs like Village Heartbeat, where you in, engage people with other people so their social support are really very, very effective. And at the health department, this is one of our signature programs, Village Heartbeat. Um, and it's a faith-based intervention. And we found, particularly in some of our minority communities, particularly in the African American and Latino communities, that's a place that, that people go and that, that there's a lot of trust and a lot of willingness to, uh, to support each other. Uh, we talk about... Uh, the numbers, we talk about taking programs to scale. How do you take a, a program that's in 30, 40 nurses and really take it out community-wide? And I think that's, our work is cut out for us. That is the next step. If we want to make Mecklenburg County, if we want to make Charlotte a healthier place, we need to take these kinds of things to scale. And this, our, our number one priority is Village Heartbeat and really trying to engage the faith community so we can see this in every church. If other churches are interested, can they reach out to the health department yes, to get they involved? Can, they can call the health department and we'd be happy to work with them. So what else do we need to know, folks, that we can empower? I want to hear from anyone right now. Dr. Garvin Brown. I, in the beginning of the program, you made mention of Remarkable You. Um, a, a team of, of us at, at Novon Health are working with a program that's our wellness initiative called Remarkable You. And the impact that we're trying to have is the numbers that you made mention of. The 68 million, half of those don't know that they have it. So we're going out in community screening, trying to help persons to be aware of something, as uh, Dr. Jerome Williams said, because if you're not aware of something, and it being a silent killer, then you can have end organ, meaning kidney problems, heart problems, before you're ever aware that you have hypertension. One of the statistics that's really striking is that uh, oh, 67% of the people who present to the emergency room with their first stroke and 74% that present with their first heart attack and about 80, 78% with congestive heart failure for the first time don't realize it because they've had hypertension and they didn't even know it. And so for us uh, at Novon Health with our Remarkable U team, we really are trying to raise awareness to educate and activate people to be able to say, I want to know, and once I know, I want to do something about it. So I'm really excited to be a part of something that is really trying to make a difference in the lives of persons in our communities. Sometimes we're so modest that we don't see ourselves as remarkable, but I love that concept that every one of us can be remarkable. We just need to be in control of mm -hmm. our lives and be more intentional. I think you were ready to say something. Yes, i also like to echo the fact that uh, Dr. Garman Brown mentioned uh, we're trying to activate individuals at, at uh, Novant and activate the community. And when individuals are activated, they can 
um, turn the needle very quickly. And what do I mean by that? I think that we need to be um, more collaborative and think outside the box as it relates to uh, working with businesses. I think we should support the businesses and restaurants and industries that promote healthy lifestyle. And so uh, we've seen over the decades how fast food restaurants have changed their menus. And they've changed their menus not because of the desire to want to change, but because of the court of public opinion. Um, and so if we can galvanize enough individuals in our community to say, hey, we will uh, populate this particular establishment or we will use this particular establishment because they are health conscious and they're contributing to the community, I think that a number of businesses um, will follow such that uh, we'll have healthier choices in our markets, healthier uh, choices in our stores. Anyone else have anything to add in that, well, Dr. And, and I would drill it right down in addition to what the, the wonderful things they have said. The person, the personal accountability. You know, we need we need to preach that. Look, look in the mirror, recognize that I need to do this for me and my health. It's so important that we take ownership of our health. Uh, not, not, it's not our parents. It's, it's not our children. It's not anybody but the person looking at you in the mirror. And, and, and take the, to make the effort to, to eat better, to decrease your salt, to go to the doctor, to go to these screenings, to find out what's going on. Be your, your own best health advocate. It's great information, but I often say I need a buddy. So even with Village Heartbeat, what a nice concept, because that way you kind of have the buddy system so that if you do, so much of our social lives is to go out to eat for something social to do. But if you're with someone who's trying to have the same healthy lifestyle as you are, you won't get the sweet tea or you won't order the fried chicken. You can make the healthier choices if you're with someone. But it's a little bit harder when your friend's having the cupcake and and you're just eating the salad. I was going to say you need to have the right buddy because, <laughs> because statistics have shown that Obesity is contagious, meaning that if you are not obese, but you have a friend that's obese, you have a greater likelihood of becoming obese as you continue to be friends with that person. Now, that's not to say you can't be friends with people who are overweight. Thank goodness people are my friend. But, um, but it is to say you do need to pay attention to your friends, and maybe your friends need to do things together to be healthier. Great information. Well, you know what? We've got another segment we need to talk about. And finally tonight, we want to talk about diabetes. The American Diabetes Association says it's the seventh leading cause of death in the United States. So how many people in the U.S. have pre-diabetes? Is it 20 million are pre-diabetes, 88 million, or 100 million? So I'm hearing a lot of 100 million, so it's a little bit better than that, my friends. The answer is 88 million, but it's growing. And in fact, nine out of 10 don't even know they have it. So here's one last question for you. People with diabetes are at higher risk of having which of the following health complications? Are they more at risk of blindness, kidney disease, heart disease and stroke, amputations, or E, all of the above? <laughs> oh, everybody caught on to this one. I know you even knew it at home, didn't you? It's E, all of the above. Well, adults make up about 85% of diabetics, and children account for just about 15%. And the longer you have the condition and don't manage it properly, the greater your risk of developing those horrible complications. Well, let's start with the basics. Understanding the two different types of diabetes is critically important. Carolina Impact's Danielle Koser explains them. Sprinting down the hallway and fighting the force of resistance bands. Step. Students at Oak Ridge Middle School trained to be track stars. Set. Go. But something sets 12-year-old Hannah Self apart from the rest of the pack. They said her blood sugar was 740. And I said, OK. And he said, Mrs. Self, normal blood sugar is 100. You need to get to the emergency room right away. And so that started our journey. Hannah suffers from type 1 diabetes, an autoimmune disease developing when a person's pancreas stops producing insulin. The diagnosis brought Hannah's carefree childhood to a halt. Hannah was in the hospital for three days. Um, she got started on insulin, and she immediately started feeling better. Then a healthy eight-year-old, the diagnosis came as a shock. Each year, doctors diagnose about 30,000 people across the U.S. with type 1 diabetes, formerly known as insulin-dependent or juvenile-onset diabetes. About half are children. Researchers are still trying to understand what causes the disease. Many believe it's a combination of genetic factors and environmental triggers. There really is nothing that we could have done to prevent Hannah being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. There's also no cure. 
people think that insulin is a cure. It's not a cure, it's just a treatment. 37-year-old Patrick Houston says he was blindsided when doctors diagnosed him with diabetes about a year ago. That day I was in the hospital, I, I decided to do everything. I knew eventually if I didn't make some kind of change, I was going to die. Patrick suffers from type 2 diabetes, formerly known as non-insulin dependent or adult onset diabetes, meaning his body makes insulin but doesn't use it properly. And then your pancreas's job is to make insulin. So Doctors say type 2 diabetes is often preventable. Being overweight and having a family history of diabetes raises your risk for developing the disease. There's a two to three fold increased risk of developing diabetes if you have a first degree relative with diabetes. The CDC, or Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, say 21.9 million people across the U.S. have diabetes. Nearly 95 percent of those people have type 2 diabetes. Millions more are at risk for developing it. 86 million Americans, or nearly one in every three people, have prediabetes, a condition easily detected through a simple blood test. It increases risk of heart attack, eye problems. Dr. Michael Hoban recommends getting screened for diabetes annually. It's silent until the sugar numbers start to get fairly elevated. So some of the cardinal signs we tell folks to look for are excessive thirst, excessive urination, tired all the time. Once I was diagnosed, I discovered, okay, this is why I probably feel sluggish all the time. Unlike type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes can be delayed, even prevented with a healthy lifestyle. There's data to show that just lifestyle modification with diet and exercise can reduce the progression of diabetes and the complications by up to 50%. When I was told I had diabetes, my first thought was, dang, I gotta give up Kool-Aid. And I hated that. Patrick weaned himself off insulin shots and lost 40 pounds through a healthy diet and regular exercise. But for people with type 1 diabetes, a healthy diet and exercise will never replace doses of insulin. Hannah checks her blood sugar level eight times a day by pricking her finger, placing a drop of blood on a test strip and inserting the strip into a glucose meter, getting a reading in seconds. I'm used to it, but it never really gets easier. She constantly balances doses of insulin with the food she eats and activities like this. So my blood sugar is 96 right now. Today, her blood sugar level falls in the normal range before practice, meaning she doesn't need an insulin shot, just a snack to make sure her blood sugar doesn't drop too low during practice. All right, guys, get ready. On your mark, set, go. For diabetics, monitoring blood sugar levels is crucial. Left uncontrolled, the disease can lead to serious complications, such as blindness, kidney failure, heart disease, stroke, and loss of toes, feet, or legs. It's clear that the complications from diabetes go up the longer you have the disease. I just took ownership of my life. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to go down this path anymore. Each day, diabetics like Patrick and Hannah work to control their diabetes so the disease doesn't control them. I think diabetes has taught me that I can really do anything and I shouldn't let anything get in my way. Hannah puts her words in action, pushing through practice alongside her teammates, refusing to let countless finger pricks take away her spark. <laughs> Hannah's smile reflects her determination to take her diagnosis in stride. For Carolina Impact, I'm Danielle Koser reporting. Thanks so much, Danielle. Well, the American Diabetes Association has some pretty startling numbers I'd like to share right now. $245 billion is the total cost of diagnosed diabetes in the United States in the recent numbers that we have available. $176 billion is the cost for direct medical costs and $69 billion in reduced productivity. Those are some pretty scary numbers. Dr. Spitz, I want to start with you on this one. You know, that's earth shattering right there, all related to diabetes. Absolutely. It's, it's not just taking care of the blood sugar, diabetes causes so many complications that the cost to someone's health and the cost of care in dollars and cents really starts to uh, aggregate very quickly. You know, we talk about analogies, and I call you my analogy doctor. You have a million of them. Share some of those with us now that can really drive home the point of how we can deal with this condition. 
well, I don't know if I have a million of them, but here's my. my well, we don't uh, have time for all a million of them right, right. now. So here's but give my, me a my, few. my NASCAR analogy. Think of think of uh, a hill, and the car's at the top of the hill, and the brakes are out. So as it starts to just roll down the hill, that's pre-diabetes, and. Uh, in your imagination, you can kind of get in front of that car and stop it, maybe even push it back up to the hill to normalize the blood sugar. And that's because you saw it starting to happen and you got on it earlier. As it starts to roll down the hill more, well then that's early type two diabetes. And you can still get in front of that car. Maybe you can't push it back up the hill, but maybe you can stop it from rolling further and control it and prevent the complications. And then if you, still have your head in the sand, then the car gets further down the hill, you've had diabetes for many years, don't know it, you've developed complications, uh, and we're talking type two now. And at that point, not only is the car further down the hill, but it's rolling faster, and you can't stop it. You can only just maybe slow it down a little bit. So the, the importance uh, of, that, of that analogy is getting to it early on and getting screened, uh, especially if you have risk factors like you're overweight or have a family history or high blood pressure. Um, and if you're at risk, really getting on top of it with lifestyle. You know, I've talked to friends who talk about being pre-diabetes and they're totally afraid of being on any kind of medication. People are fearful of medications. Should we be? Should we not be? Is it better to control the condition? I know even with my own husband who had a family history going back to heart disease. His father had quadruple bypass at 48 years old. So before my husband was even 30, he was dealing with high triglycerides. But with the medication, his numbers are fantastic. And we, you know, he has a great long life to live ahead of him. Should people be afraid of, of any type of medication? A lot of people are. I, I don't think so. I mean, you have to keep in mind that while much of this is lifestyle, a lot of it is genetic. And, um, and even a type two, we think about them as being very insulin resistant. Well, they also actually have a defect in the production of insulin. Uh, and also their bodies, without even eating, create more glucose without being told to. And so these are defects that, that lifestyle can play a big role to improve, but it may not be enough. Uh, as that car gets further down the hill, that's when you need medications. And, and the medications, there's side effects like any intervention, but we know that no matter how you do it, getting the blood sugar down lowers the risk of the eye damage, the kidney damage, and the nerve damage. If you're a type two diabetic, that even if your cholesterol's pretty good, that the commonly used and now often generic and inexpensive drugs, the statin drugs, can lower the most feared complication, heart attacks uh, and stroke and, and death from vascular disease. Likewise, maybe you've got a strong family history of high blood pressure and you're doing everything right. Well, we know that treating that blood pressure, if it's high, even with a medication, lowers that risk of heart failure and a stroke. So, so the medications, it, it, is, it is fearful. It is, it is a little mind-boggling because many of our patients are on several. But in many cases, these are things that help to save a patient's life. And you could have more fear for not dealing with the condition Absolutely. than for the potential side effects of a medication. That's right. Uh, you know, the, the, it's incredible how far we've come in uh, helping people who, who develop heart disease and who have had stroke. But uh, one of my great goals is to, to hopefully make it so they don't have to see Jerome in the first place. Yes, I think it's very important um, to uh, take that question when the patient states, I'm concerned about medication. That's an opportunity for education. And I never uh, disagree with a patient when, I, when they say, well, these medications can be dangerous. And I then uh, enter into the discussion of risk versus benefit, okay? And that's one uh, benefit of all the disease processes that we're discussing today is that there's a wealth of information and data to have a a very good discussion and detailed discussion about the risk benefits, pros and cons, um, behavior changes. So I think it's a huge opportunity when that question comes up to educate patients on risk versus benefits, medicines versus no medicines. And um, ultimately, once you present them with that information, I think they have a clear picture of which direction they need to go in. Well, now we need to take a couple of questions from the audience. We have one right now. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Jacqueline Williams. And my question is, what steps are you taking to educate parents about diabetes, high blood pressure, and all of that, so they can make smarter choices regarding their children, exercise, food, and so forth? Let's start with Dr. Plesha from the health department. What kind of things are you able to do to help educate on this? 
Well, I, you know, I think that there is a lot of awareness now about these conditions, and uh, most of our focus really is on the, the risk factors that lead to them. So um, obesity, good nutrition, physical activity, and then the other thing that Dr. Williams mentioned earlier, tobacco use, um, not as important for diabetes, but very important for some of the other conditions that we've talked about. Those are the core risk factors, and uh, you know, I think we need to continue to make sure that parents understand how important healthy eating, regular physical activity, and not using tobacco products are uh, for their children. Final question this evening, go right ahead. Good evening, my name is John Smith. Um, at 15, I lost my dad to a massive coronary when he was only 58. So I've grown up with knowing cardiovascular and obesity, and then luckily today I found out that the third one jumps in for me now too. Um, but as we move from a society of corrective medicine to more preventive medicine, and I know that part of this is falling back on us as preventive. You mentioned data, and we're all internet savvy to go out and find lots of data, but how are you as professionals, and in this case Novant, using that data to help the patients uh, be better aware of this type of, these conditions and what, what steps we can take to better ourselves? What I see as an endocrinologist is that in the primary care community, there's a, a much, 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 much greater emphasis on screening people for diabetes. It is an education issue. Most people who see a doctor know what their cholesterol is. And uh, occasionally it'll come up in social situations where they talk about their health. But how many people know what their fasting blood sugar is? So down the road, when I'm nominated for Surgeon General, I'm gonna basically make it so that uh, when, a, when a lipid profile is done, that a glucose is automatically uh, part of that. And that way, when a patient does or a, per, uh, a person wants to know what their fasting cholesterol is, they'll automatically have a glucose as part of that. But there's a long way to go. But compare now where you never hear anybody say, in the patient population, or very, very, very rarely hear someone say, oh, I don't have diabetes, I just have a touch of sugar. Um, when I started here 21 years ago, I heard that all the time, and I'm sitting there going, no, you, you have diabetes, and these are the terrible things that can happen. I almost never hear that now. There's a much greater awareness uh, in the community, um, including through events like this. You know what, I'd love to talk more, but we're running out of time. Once again, I'd love to thank our panelists, Dr. Marcus Plesha, Dr. Ophelia Garman-Brown, Dr. David Vollinger, Dr. Jerome Williams, and Dr. Adam Spitz. We are so grateful for your time. We are grateful for your information. We are grateful for the Novant Health screening experts who are outside of our auditorium today. And if people have not been screened, I hope they're going to stop by there and know their numbers. We learned today numbers are empowering and we've all heard the phrase that knowledge is power but the more we learn about these health conditions the more we can start implementing changes in our lives and if you aren't willing to do it for yourself maybe you'll consider doing it for the loved ones in your lives they need you they need you to make a difference they need you to take care of them and if you're not taking care of yourself we can't take care of others around us so we hope this evening you've been empowered and you're going to make a difference so that you can live an incredible life and enjoy all the great things that are in store for each and every one of us we thank you for watching this evening we appreciate your time we hope you'll join us again next time for carolina impact good night my friends funding for tonight's special is provided by novant health a production of WTBI-PBS Charlotte.